Ladies and gentlemen, today is January 18th, 2017, and this is the Can't Kill Show, episode 325, where we learn to be better artists. My name is Keenan Lafferty, and I would like to welcome you to another show. Today we are going to be jumping back into, I almost messed it up, jumping back into part two of Casual Diva, and we're going to be going from this. This is where we left off last week. If you want to go back a week and check out how we got here, just click up here, and... We're going to be going from this to this, and we're going to be learning about lighting. We're going to be learning specifically about blue lighting. See this computer screen over here? And the TV that is in the reflection behind us? That is blue light, ladies and gentlemen. And it does all kinds of weird things when it interacts with not only our skin, but clothing and basically everything. We're going to be talking about that today, okay? But before we get into that, we need to take a stroll down a very special place. And that is, of course, the lovely lane. So journey with me, if you will, over to tinyurl slash kankalefanart. Click on this secret link right here. Don't tell anybody. See y'all. Click on that. And when you do, you will be dazzled by the amazing pieces that you guys have been submitting. So thank you to everyone who has been submitting their artwork, as usual. If you have not yet come out of your shells, then please head on over, like the page, submit your art. And then you could be scrolling on by next week and getting featured on the show. Yes, that's right. That could be you right there. By the way, I really like that Emma comic. Thank you so much. You guys, I, I seriously, I was showing my girlfriend the, the, just that comic and just like in general, and I'm like, man, my viewers are the best. They make the best art. They just make the best fan art and the best art. So it really means a lot, guys. It really, it, it's so cool to see you guys improving every week and like submitting new things. And I hope that what I teach you guys today, you guys are going to get some good value from, but that's enough talking, okay? Enough talk. Let's walk the walk. All right. So diva, casual diva. We've been having a lot of fun with this getting our reflections in there and all that stuff. Let's do one more comparison. Okay, so we're wanting to go from this. And last week, just to sum it all up, we learned about masks. We learned about how to set up your drawing in a way that's gonna make it easy on you as you go about trying to color it, okay? So just as a quick setup, just as a quick uh, refresher, we have our lines that are separate from all of these little masks back here, right? All of these little colors are on their own masks. And the reason why we do this is because we're eventually gonna be going in and we're gonna be coloring and lighting things, right? We're gonna be lighting our piece. And we want each of our materials, each of our things to be on their own separate layer. And what that allows us to do is things like this. So journey with me into the, let's, let's carve our way, hack our way through the forest that is the layers. And let's go ahead and see if we can find what the heck is going on in here, okay? So we've got a lot of layers that are like clipped back. You can see a lot of these uh, clipping mask layers. Uh, and let's go ahead and just find something. Let's do the skin. The skin is probably the most important one. So you can see here, the skin light is actually on its own layer and it's clipped back to the skin. So what that means is if I unclip it by, by the way, you, the way you do this is you hold alt and click between the two layers that you want to basically clip. But what is a clipping mask? Well, a clipping mask is something that you draw on its own and then as you put it on top of something, right? Say we wanted to bind it to our skin layer. As I hold Alt and click between the two, notice what happens? See how not only the light affects the skin? See before it was like spilling all over into every, everywhere else, it's spilling into the shirt, it's going everywhere. It's really messy. Well, we don't like that, okay? We wanna be able to clip it back to our predetermined, our predetermined mask, okay? And that makes lighting a cinch, makes, uh, makes it a cinch. And just as a quick example, let me go ahead and make a new layer and see how this one is uh, this one is already clipped back. This is exactly what it does. So I'm just gonna use a crazy, I'm gonna use a crazy color here so you can see exactly what happens. So see how I can just like paint in whatever color I want. I can make her literally pink, right? But then let's say that I wanted to go back to my shadows. Say I liked the color that I used for my shadows. I don't have to be like, oh, what were the colors that I used for my shadows? And, and then go over here and try to like pick out the right one. Oh, I think it was like kind of like a bluish, purple desaturated thing and then try to like paint that back in. No, you don't have to worry about that. All you have to do is because, see how this is clipped back, right? This is our original layer. This is our original skin layer, which represents our shadows. So all we have to do to get back to our shadows is we erase the light. We erase the light that we put in, okay? So take a look at this and then boom, look at that. And then you can do like cast shadows. You can erase like lightly like this. You can do some cast shadows for the hair and voila. It looks a little bit out of place because now, oh, and this is a good example. And this leads us to, this is a great segue into our question. Now, normally we take questions at the end of the show, but this is a very important question. And it goes with today's 
lesson. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. We'll do question catapults afterwards. I'm going to answer a couple more questions, but this one is really important. It's coming in from uh, Krylisha, Kry Krylika <laughs> from the MZ. And Krylika is asking, hello, I usually use layer effects, multiply, overlays, lighten to uh, and undo transform functions when drawing. However, when studying color or lighting, I try not to use these cheats. Instead, I try to color pick from the color wheel. Okay, so basically they're asking, what's my opinion on using multiply layers and lighten layers and all the fancy things and all the fancy um, layer effects that are in Photoshop as opposed to actually learning what the actual color is, okay? Now, I actually do not have a problem with either one. In fact, if you can get the same, so see how we had to like make this skin? Let me go ahead and go back to how we opened this. So see, let's go ahead and actually go in and take a look at this skin color because this was chosen. This was chosen. This is not a, let's see, where is the skin light? Oh man, this is like crazy. This is like one of the most complicated PSDs I've ever worked with. Okay, so right here. See the skin light, look right here. Look at this uh, layer style, it's on normal. So that means that there's no like lighten, like see how we can like cycle through the different layers here. We can go to like lighten. Actually lighten looks really nice. I actually like that. I think it blends a little bit better. Maybe, oh no, it's just an optical illusion. It looks about the same. But anyway, you can do like screen and sometimes people will want to cycle through these layers to find something that they like, find, a, find an effect that they feel looks right. And uh, I'm not against doing this. However, I would say that when you're done, when you find something that looks right, I really do want you to go in there with your color picker and I want you to take a look at what color is actually there, okay? And this is gonna play into how I chose the right colors for Diva Skin, but in this case, uh, let's say that you pick this layer style, which is uh, color dodge. And you say, oh, I really like that. But then I want you to go in and I want you to ask yourself, why? Why do I like that? Well, what color is the light here? Oh, wow, it's actually a really desaturated pink. That's interesting. And then take a look at the transition. Oh, the transition actually goes a little bit down and to the right, right? So we're doing a little bit color color boomerang there, right? And then also pay attention. Here's another thing that I really like to do. I like to press and hold on the on the eyedrop tool. Let me go ahead and zoom in for this. This will really help a lot. And then I want you to pay attention to hue shifts. Now hue shifting is what happens when you watch this little Richter scale. See how we go from like red to purple? Now watch what happens when I hold and click, right? Do you see how the Richter scale is moving around? So that means that our hue shift is going from the light moving more towards red. When we go to the shadow, we hue shift towards purple. Okay, and that in a nutshell is how I want you guys to start studying your lights. Start studying the relationships uh, between what makes things look good, what makes things look pleasing. Okay, so that, enough of that. Let's go ahead and put it into use with the actual colors that we used, okay? And you might be wondering, well, well, how the heck did you know which colors to use? Well, we can get to that in just a second because let's take a look at this. What color is Diva skin? Well, from the game, we can, we can infer that it is just a regular kind of peach looking skin. Yeah, look at what color I've chosen here to represent the light of her skin. It's actually this blue color. Wow, that's interesting. All of a sudden Diva is turning into a night elf. Yet when you first look at this, it didn't look out of place. Did you notice that? Now let's go ahead and take a look at the hue shift. Let's push and hold and then drag it into the shadows. Whoa, look at that massive hue shift that's happening. It's pulling us all the way. And again, looking right here, look at the Richter scale. It's pulling us all the way up to like the purples. Isn't that interesting? Yet do you look at the skin? If I was to ask you what color this was right here, this is where it's really gonna blow your mind, guys. We're going into color relativity. Color relativity, which is actually one of my favorite things in the world because it puzzled me for so long. And I would ask you, let, let's do an exercise here. Let's do an exercise. So look at this, guys. Do you know what color that is? Can you tell me what color is within this circle? Well, I know I, I showed it earlier, so you know now, but you would say, hmm, that looks like a dark peach. That looks like a dark peach. I would say it's probably right around there. I would say, yeah, that, that color looks about right. But now watch what happens when I actually select it. Oh wow, it's actually more, it's a very desaturated purple. We've hue shifted more towards purple and we have desaturated. Now, why did that happen? Well, there's a couple of reasons why, but maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Um, let me go into <laughs> color relativity. Okay, yeah, let's go into color relativity. And I'm gonna talk to you guys about why I chose the colors that I did. Now for that, I need to pull in a photo, okay? Now this is a really good thing, guys. So I just went on Google and I typed in some keyword, probably TV light, okay? And then I got something like this. And then I went in and I started studying. I started studying a few things. 
And that is, so let's go ahead and zoom in on this piece here. Let's take a look at some of the color relativities that are happening. So we look at this and we say, oh, okay, yeah, that's a person in front of a TV. And we know that there's a blue light hitting them. And because of that, well, let's take a look at the skin. What color is the skin? Wow, it's about the same color that we chose here for diva skin. But I wanted to show that there was a little bit more of, um, I wanted to have a little bit more of a skin tone in there. I mean, here you can still see a little bit of skin tone appearing. And that is through the hue shift. Let's take a look at the hue shift that's happening here in the skin. Now there's not as much of a hue shift, not quite as crazy as what we had before. Now, the reason for this is A, I like to exaggerate it a little bit, and B, I wanted the, the light to mix a little bit more with the skin. And when you have blue, okay, now this is where it gets a little bit complicated. When you have blue light that is mixing with skin, with peach skin, you're going to be desaturated. Now, the reason why this is is because blue and peach, which are opposites, right? Blue and orange, they come together and they neutralize. Okay, I'm glad I finally got that out, okay? They neutralize. Not to mention lighter things, as things get lighter, they have a tendency to desaturate as well. So we have two things playing to our advantage when it comes to choosing a desaturated color for the lightest parts of the skin, putting a little bit of blue in there. But then this huge, huge shift that occurs is because um, we're now mixing and we're kind of like mixing the blue light with our skin and our blood vessels and the red, right? The red blood vessels that are within there. And that is going to give us this purple, but it's also still going to desaturate. You see how I went towards purple, but it's still very, very desaturated. Yet when you put this color next to this color, it creates the illusion of skin, okay? <laughs> that, that is probably the best way that I can describe it. But yeah, I would highly recommend and highly encourage you guys to go online and take a look at some reference photos for like weird, because this is like weird, Weird lighting effects because this stuff used to puzzle me for so long and you can tell I'm even more puzzled trying to explain this to you But um, yeah, take a look at this stuff like eye drop it and be like this looks like skin But why does it look like skin? Well, it's probably looks like skin because Well, look at this. We know that the color of this couch is white We know that the color of the couch is white, but and this is about relativity guys. Okay, so look at how saturated this white couch is Look at this, I'm eye dropping that and it's blue. Yet when I go to the skin, what happens? The skin desaturates, right? It desaturates and begins to neutralize. So we can infer that the light that is interacting with the skin is a peach color, which is in the orange family. Therefore, it goes from here, white, to here, which is gray, right? So we know, looking at these two colors, that that girl is in fact not a night elf. She has regular skin color. All right, okay, now that I've thoroughly confused you, it's time to move on to the next part. Oh yeah, and there should be uh, a time lapse, time lapse. So you guys are really happy with this. Let's go ahead and, I mean, I hope you're happy with this. I might sound really full of myself to say that you're happy with it. I don't know if you are. If you like it, then, well, that's great. But let's go ahead and get to the time lapse and let's talk about the good stuff. Because I actually did struggle a little bit with my skin tones. I struggled a little bit with it. Okay, but overall, I was really happy with this piece. And I was thinking everything that is affecting this character is a blue light, blue light. And you have to think about it. It's like blue mixing with, in this case, this is like a black shirt or like a dark gray shirt. Well, that's gonna reflect blue. It's gonna reflect a blue uh, color, the white leggings. That's not gonna reflect white with a blue light. It's going to reflect this very bright blue. See, look at that. And I even hue shifted it more towards like this teal to make it look even brighter. Okay, so uh, yeah, I was really happy with how this began to turn out. Another thing that I'm still trying to play around with, I'm not super comfortable like teaching this yet, is exposure. And that has to do with the contrast between the light parts of the piece and the dark parts of the piece. Now here's something else that's really cool. Um, I imagine like you always wanna think about your lighting setup in this case. Um, and I was trying to think if that relates back to the well, I guess it does relate to the old question. And that is, um, you wanna think about your, your light sources, right? When you're studying color and you're studying those references, I want you to think about when you're eye dropping things, when you're eye dropping, I want you to ask yourself, why is that color there? Why does it appear that way? And for this picture specifically, we have a couple interesting light sources. A, we have the brightest one, 
which is our TV, right? That's shining on the skin, it's shining on the front of the bed and everything. But then we have these warm lights. We have these warm yellow lights that are throughout the rest of the room and also on top of the ceiling uh, that are shining down this very, very subtle warm light. And that is going to affect our shadows. That is going to affect our shadows very, very slightly. And when you do both of those things, and you can see that right here with like these little lanterns, see how it's just lighting ever so slightly the curtains just back here? I really like that. It gives us a, a, nice, a nice contrast as well as, oh, you can see on the edge of the bed here, you can see the warm light kind of coming from the top. But notice how it only affects the shadows. That's because that's the only place where the light can be seen. It can only be seen in the darkest parts of the shadow. Otherwise, it would be overtaken by the brighter TV light, okay? Man, this is like really, this is really confusing. I know, I know, I know. But the last week we went into something really, really fun, and that is experimenting with this new thing, which is the reflection, the reflection. Let's go ahead and see if we can find that. First of all, where the heck is it? Ebb, ebb, is this it? Where is it? Is this whole thing it? No, it's not it. Oh, it's in the background. Okay, excellent. Okay, so last week we were experimenting with this thing called a reflection. Now notice how, here's a great example of how I have used the layer style to do a lot of the work for me. Because if you look right here, the layer style is called pass through. Let's set it to normal and see what this layer actually looks like. Oh, okay, interesting, isn't that awesome? So uh, the reason why I like to sometimes use this stuff to my advantage is because it allows you to just very quickly get a feeling for what your picture is going to look like at the end. And sometimes it looks good enough that you can just roll with it to the very end. And in this case, I know I have to get in there and I wanna kinda of clean up like this shadow and everything. There's like some artifacts in here and I wanna maybe stylize the screenshot of Titanfall a little bit more. Yes, she is playing Titanfall. <laughs> uh, this is, I think this is Scorch. <laughs> yeah, this is a screenshot of Scorch. Uh, but I figured that makes sense, right? Diva playing uh, Titanfall, she's into mechs, she has her own mech. It's, uh, think of it as her training before she became the actual Diva in Overwatch. Love stuff like that. So anyway, <laughs> that's the reflection in the, in the windows. And so what I ended up doing was I actually just cycled through these. I cycled through all these different layers to get different um, versions of the reflection. And what I ended up really liking was screen was one that I really liked, but the one that I loved the most was definitely the pass through. Pass through just looked really nice. And where the heck is pass through? Oh, there we go. Yeah, so I really liked this one. And what this does, I went into detail a lot more about reflections last week. So if you're curious about that, the episode is up here. Talk a little bit more about how reflections work. But can you imagine how hard it would be to like paint the reflection, right? Paint the reflection in the back of the room. And then in the darkest points, right? Then have the mental note that, oh, okay, I'll be able to see some of these buildings back here. I'll be able to see some of these background buildings through the reflection and then try to paint in the little lights, try to paint in the tower, and then try to have everything work properly. So that is the, the best time when I found using layer styles helps the most, is when you're working with things that are sort of like translucent, you're creating like glass, or if a character has like a visor or some sort of uh, glass type thing in front of them, um, I find that using layer styles works really well for that stuff, translucent materials. So yeah, but then, like I said, always go in there and ask yourself, Ask yourself, if I had to actually paint this, what is actually happening here? How is this reflection interacting with the window? How would I do this if I had like an easel here and I didn't have any, no layer styles, no nothing. It's like, I have to literally look at what colors are happening and the relationships within, okay? So, but don't be afraid of that stuff. It doesn't make you any less of an artist by using everything at your disposal, right? People that think that, you know, you, oh, well you let the computer do most of the work. So you're not like a real artist, right? Doesn't matter, doesn't matter about that stuff. Let those people think what they want. The real thing that matters is the result at the very end, okay? So I hope that puts to rest any of the problems that you guys may have had with that. Um, yeah, but let's go ahead and take a look. So you can see here, check it out. So see, we have our cool lights and then warm lights. And check out the, the hue shifts, hue shifts, big old hue shifts. I really wanted to exaggerate this even more because I just felt like it brought a really nice balance, right? The reason why I didn't wanna do something super blue is because this, this picture is nice and it makes sense, right? But introducing some more colors and some more contrasting colors, I felt 
made the picture feel more cozy, whereas this one feels very like cold and like barren and kind of like depressing. I didn't want that to be the feeling of my piece. I wanted to throw some warms in there. Therefore, I added in these warm lights in the background. And also I imagined the lights on the ceiling kind of like um, projecting, projecting some warm lights onto the rest of the room. So it feels more cozy and relaxed. So I think that is going to catch us up to where we are now. And yeah, from here, the next week, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be talking about overpainting. And that is the final, the final step where we go in, <coughs> excuse me, the final step where we go in and we name our layer OP, which is arguably the most important step. And what we're gonna be doing is we're just gonna be going in there and cleaning everything up because the hard work has been done already. The hard work has been done already, but I'm gonna go ahead and tease you guys with this so that we guys can be looking forward to next week. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna be going in and cleaning stuff up. So see all these like little artifacts in here, all this crap, we wanna get rid of this. We wanna sharpen up, you know, sharpen up some, um, sharpen up our shadows, just kind of clean everything up. Now, could this have been avoided if we just had slightly more clean line art? Well, yes, but I really wanted to get to the coloring phase of this piece. And I figured that, you know, I really don't mind a little bit of sketchiness in my pieces, I really don't. I think it's a hallmark of my style. I really like it a lot. And to be honest, I just, I'm one of those guys that I, I like, I have an idea and I just want to get it out as quickly as possible. Like I don't have weeks, even though I was a splash artist and I would spend like a month on one piece, rest assured that was not, that was not a pleasant month because it, I would have the idea for the next piece already. And it was so hard to just kind of sit in one place and work on one piece for a month. I'm not that kind of guy. So it's tough, it's tough. So. Um, that's why this one's a little bit more, a little bit more sketchy, but I like it. I like that stuff. So see, that's what we're going to be doing with our overpainting. We're going to be going through the piece and lo and behold, when we go through the entire thing and we clean it up like that, it's going to be looking awesome, people. It's going to be looking freaking awesome. Alrighty, with all that out of the way, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to cast some question catapults. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for choosing a style and setting. Coming in from Doritos Canada. Great, great name and very fitting for what we're working on. Okay, so Doritos Canada is asking, I spent the, fast, uh, the past few years telling myself to make a comic. My friends keep writing up great ideas and stories. Tell me to practice on, or tell me to practice, but my style just isn't right for comics, right? I will pick up the odd comic from the bookstore, read several web comics. Okay, so I get where you're coming from. Does anyone have any suggestions on how to find the right style for making comics? and uh, stuck on what even steps it takes to find a suitable style that would make a comic manageable. Okay, great question, Doritos Canada. I'm more than happy to answer this for you. In fact, why not just shamelessly plug my own comic while I'm at it? Okay, so um, I'll answer this by taking you over to Emma. Okay, so I went through a lot of iterations when I was making this comic, and one of the most important things that brought me to the final style was realizing that I was gonna have to draw these characters hundreds and hundreds of times, okay? So, um, I had to figure out a way to, uh, first of all, like you can take a look at Nico here. Let's go ahead and zoom in on this so you guys can see it a little bit better. Okay, so let's take a look at like Nico here. See how all these lines and everything just becomes like one shape, right? Uh, now this is just an example. I'm not saying that you have to do this because there's tons of American comics out there. In fact, like old school, new school that have like cross hatching and like all this like shading and stuff. And, and it's more realistic looking, something more like Watchmen, right? And that is really, really freaking awesome. It's an amazing style. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. Well, actually, maybe I am saying you shouldn't do that because the people that made Watchmen, that is like... That is either a, actually, I don't know if it was just one artist. It couldn't have been one artist. There is a team of artists that is making Watchmen or one really crazy man that uh, made that entire comic, right? And you want to be most, you want to be most conscious of the actual style and the simplicity. You want to have your characters be very, very simple to draw, okay? Now, a good example, just to make sure that you're on the right track is I want you to think about animation. Now, do you notice in animation with cartoons, the characters are all very, very simple and the colors, you're, they're able to be distinguished by flat colors, lines and flat cell shaded colors. Um, they're, they're not super realistic. So I would highly recommend going for something like this. 
Here's a good example of like, see how the people here, like they're very relatable. They can show expression, which is also one of the most important things. But you notice how you could even get away with making their eyes just dots. You can make their eyes, you know, very, very simple. Um, so play around with a bunch of different things like that, but keep in mind that the main thing that you're going for is simplicity. Okay, now here's the best example of simplicity that I could show. Uh, do you see how the hair, like like Clem's mustache here, see how it's all one shape? Emma's hair, it's one shape that sits on top of the head. Like see how there's not individual strands? It's been condensed into this one iconic shape. Uh, that's the best thing that I can explain to you. Think like Samurai Jack, if you're familiar with that or just any other t like animated style in that vein. Um, I'm really a fan of doing something like that, okay? So, that is the answer to the first question. Moving on to the next one. All right, this one is coming in from Dispel. He is asking, hello, no photo on your resume. Wait, number one, no photo on your resume. Some people talk about instant elimination. Others disagree. Does this apply to the game industry? Do they even read your cover letter? What is the exact elimination process? Huh, one portfolio, two CV, three cover letter. Thanks in advance. All right, I'm glad you asked this question to spell because I'm here to tell you that, wait, no photo on your resume. I don't even know what that means. Like, I've never put a photo on, on your resume. Are people doing that nowadays? Like if you're like, if you're applying to like do a commercial or like a movie, yeah, I could totally see like throwing your headshot on there, but they don't, People don't give a crap if you're gonna be doing artwork for a video game, what you look like. No, that that's total, that doesn't eliminate you at all. Okay, so um, yeah, I've never done it and it's never hindered me at all. Uh, I would rather people be pleasantly surprised by my blindingly white smile when I walk in, right? <laughs> Actually, it's not that white. It's just like the lighting is like perfect right now that it literally looks like I'm shooting lasers out of my mouth, which is awesome. All right, uh, do they even read your cover letter? Number two. Okay, uh, I would like to say, I'd like to come clean. I will say that no, we don't read your cover letter. The first thing we do is we actually look at, at your portfolio because what's the point of reading a cover letter? They're always so long anyway and you guys don't shut up and they're so, we don't have time to read your cover letter. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at your art and then we're gonna say, okay, this guy is okay. Let's see what he has to say about himself. Let's, say what, let's hear his life story and then we'll read your cover letter. But no, heck no, you should not. Don't worry too much about your cover letter. I really think that cover letters are just like a, What's the word? They're sort of like a novelty. They're kind of nice to have, but really nothing is going to replace the fact that you can do what we're looking for you to do. So make sure that you put the spotlight on that. We're not hiring you for your pen, penmanship skills. We're not hiring you for the amazing story of your life. We're hiring you for what you can do for us, okay? So make sure you show what you can do for us, okay? And that is your art. Show your skills. All right, last question coming in from Jellofish. And I love this question. This is such a good question. Thank you so much for, for giving this question, Jellyfish. Uh, does drawing not safe for work have an effect on your chances of getting hired? This is amazing. I actually love this. Uh, a lot of people would have you believe, some people, believe it or not, out there think that I'm against not safe for work or that I hate it or that people that do it are sellouts and they suck and they should be removed from the art industry forever and never get a job. And that's, of course, just not true. I enjoy all kinds of art. However, just on the Kane Kale show, I've chosen for it to be an all ages audience so we don't feature it on the show. But yeah, I have no problem with it. But the question is, uh, I've always wondered if drawing not safe for work affects your chances of getting hired. No a lot of artists who may draw not safe for work keep that stuff on a separate blog place to upload. Despite this, if they were applied to Blizzard games and Blizzard stuff, would they think differently? Yeah, yeah, I totally get where you're coming from. And I used to think this. I used to actually think this a lot uh, that, oh yeah, that person draws not safe for work. They're, they're gonna have a hard time getting hired. But that's actually just not the case at all. It, absolutely not. The only time when it would actually affect your chances uh, of getting hired is like I said before, it, if, it, if it shows too much, and I've actually seen this, I've seen this, where you're drawing for uh, specifically, it can hinder your chances if you're say drawing a children's book. And believe it or not, yes, this has happened. I've been working for a company and we're illustrating a children's book and we had an artist that specialized in adult cartoons, right? And the problem was not necessarily that he had done not safe for work stuff before. The, the problem was that, that that style sort of like it, it went into his illustration style for the kids book and it was just not appropriate, right? It wasn't like, it was mostly just like the proportions of like the females. I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, right? It just showed a little bit too much in there, a little bit too much of that that influence in there. So that's the only time when I would really feel like it would hinder your chances. If 
is as if um, if your style doing that stuff kind of ekes into something where it's not necessarily called for. But uh, I don't want you guys to be afraid about expressing yourselves. You guys, you know, you do what you want with your skills. And uh, don't feel like people are going to judge you for doing that. Really, all it comes down to, again, is what you can do here and now, the skills that you have, and can you work in a style that suits the company? So I hope you guys take that and you are relieved of a big stress on your shoulders. And yeah, don't worry about that stuff. All righty, ladies and gentlemen. Before we go, I would like to say thank you all for joining me once again. And if you would like to go to Patreon and support the show, don't take my word for this stuff, guys. I say that you can go there and download these PSDs. Yes, every single PSD that I've ever done is on that site, right? And the most important thing is that you can go through all of these layers, okay? Go through all of these layers for yourselves, okay? Take a look at how I did all this stuff. Take a look at how I lit all this stuff. Use your eyedropper tool, get in there. Get in there, learn, have fun, good luck. That's the end of the show. So thank you guys so much for joining me once again on this Wednesday, this awesome Wednesday. Thumbs up if you like it, thumbs down if you don't. My name is Keen Lafferty. I'll see you guys next week. And until then, you guys take care. See ya.